chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 tonight, or this tonight, this afternoon. Genesis chapter number 3. We'll continue our study in Genesis chapter 3. We left off last week um, about verse number 19, right around in there. And uh, may have be been verse 18. Let's go ahead and read um, verse 17. You ready? And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. What you've got to understand about our ground is it's cursed. Uh, people say, well, uh, why do we have so many health issues and all that kind of stuff? Well, and you know, why do we get tired and why do we age? Well, you're eating food out of a cursed ground, first of all. Uh, the ground is cursed. Uh, that is why when Christ and every other sacrifice, every Old Testament sacrifice that was given in Christ himself, when he, they were sacrificed, they were not sacrificed on the ground. They were sacrificed on an altar. Of course, the cross being the altar that Christ was sacrificed on. The ground's cursed. And so the ground is a cursed thing. That's why well, listen, we were taken out of the ground and we'll go back to the ground. So cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Excuse me. Notice verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So we understand that weeds and Thorns and thistles are produced. Now notice here, the first Adam was the reason why thorns and thistles came. So the last Adam, Jesus Christ, when he came and he's paying for the sin of Adam, what is he wearing upon his head? He's wearing thorns. He's wearing, wearing Adam's thorns upon his head. Verse number 19. In the sweat of thy brow, or I'm sorry, excuse me, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, Till thou return of the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Everybody in here, you have a common ancestor. Uh, that means that we believe that, uh, that you have a... Listen, evolution teaches that we all have a common ancestor, and it's the monkey. And we started from a single life form, and then evolved, and evolved, and evolved, and here we are today. Can I just time out and say this real quick? A man that believes in evolution is absolutely, I mean, that is the biggest pipe dream that scientists ever came up with. It is absolutely ridiculous. They say, well, it's ridiculous that you believe that, that you know, God spoke and it created everything. Yeah, well, you believe that there was a whole bunch of nothing and the nothing exploded and made everything. And then, it, you know, there was a ball of magma and light, you know, it rained on the magma ball for four million years and cooled the earth down. And then all of a sudden, somehow lightning struck and an organism was created. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The ridiculousness of, listen, it takes just as much faith to believe in evolution as it does believe the Bible. Now, notice it says that Eve was the mother of all living she was the common ancestor of all living. Verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. This is where we find the precedent for sacrifice in the Old Testament. Notice Adam and Eve sinned. They had sewed together fig leaves, uh, aprons of fig leaves to try to cover themselves. You know the problem with an apron, though. It doesn't cover everything. It's immodest. It doesn't cover all the nakedness. And so God made them coats of skin. Now, I want you to notice this. If, the Bible says without the shedding of blood is what? No remission, right? So that means that in Adam and Eve's case, for them and their nakedness to be covered... What did God do? God gave them coats of skin. Well, what are those coats of skin? They are the skins of dead animals, more than likely some kind of sheep note or lamb. Notice that blood had to be shed in order for God to be able to cover Adam and Eve in their nakedness. Right? Notice in the coats of skin here, 
God had to sacrifice. You say, well, where did Cain and Abel get the precedent of sacrificing a lamb? How did they know to sacrifice a lamb? Because God, Adam and Eve, no doubt, had said, yeah, when we sinned and messed up, God had to sacrifice a lamb to cover it. Now, I want you to notice verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. That is the dispensation of conscience that we talked about. What does your conscience tell you? Listen, everybody in here is born with something on the inside of them from God that is to guide you into the dictates of, your, uh, of right and wrong, and that is called your conscience. Let me give you an example, all right? You take the deepest, darkest regions of Africa that have never even seen a white man, and you go to that tribe, and guess what you're going to find? You're going to find that they have some kind of law that it's wrong to take something that's not yours. How do you explain that? If we're just a bunch of over-evolved apes, you tell me why every culture in the world has some kind of deity. Atheism is a modern vice. Charles Spurgeon used to say that atheism is not even a vice that the devils have fallen into because the devils believe and tremble, right? Every culture recognizes the fact that there is some kind of higher... You're telling me, uh, I, think it, I think it was a guy named Jordan Peterson, I think it was, if that's his name. He says you have to kind of look at, at the fact, you know, people say that, you know, we that believe in God and believe in, you know, moral rights and wrongs and all that and absolute truth. You know, there's people out there that say there is no absolute truth. You just, you know how you answer those kind of people? You look at them and say, are you absolutely sure? There is no absolute truth. There's, there might be your truth and my truth. No, 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 no. Notice, Jordan Peterson, I think is the guy who said it. He says, you have to look at the, at the evidence of history. Most people, at most times, in most places, have recognized the fact that there's a higher power. Most people, in most time, at most times, in most places, have recognized the fact that there's a higher power. Now, with that being said... You have something on the inside of you that is naturally there. It is called the conscience. You are like, quote-unquote, a god now because you know good from evil. This is exactly what Romans 2 talks about. Look at Romans chapter number 2. Look at Romans chapter 2. People say, well, what about the, the heathen that have never heard about the gospel? What about the people who've never heard of Jesus Christ? Well, look at how God deals with them in Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter 2, and look there at verse number 11. Romans 2, 11. Notice what the Bible says here. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Watch this. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Notice that God will judge a man based upon his conscience. God has given every man a certain amount of light, and if you follow that light, it will lead you to the truth about God, and that's what God will judge you based upon, the truth that you received and had. So notice, everybody has a conscience. You know, what about people that have never heard the gospel? There's three ways, uh, three ways that God has communicated to mankind. You can read these in Romans 1, Romans 2, and Romans 3. First of all, in Romans 1, God has revealed himself through the creation of mankind, or through, excuse me, through the creation of the universe. The Bible says in Psalms 19, 1, that the heavens show the handiwork of God. They defer, the firmaments declare his glory. It talks about how in Romans 1, 20, how that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. You can look out at this world and realize there's a God. 
This could not have happened. If, listen, if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all burn up. And if we were just a little bit further from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. You can't, you can't, how, how, the moon is positioned just perfectly in order to control the waves just right. I mean, how do you figure that, man? All the things of nature. Do you know that scientists, now I showed the video, this has been years ago. I mean, I think the majority of you may not have even been here uh, at that point. But I showed a video years ago where some of the leading scientists are now saying that when you get down to the very fabric of the universe, it seems like we're in some kind of computer simulation because of how well orchestrated everything is. That What's that, uh, that black scientist, Neil... Uh, Neil deGrasse or yeah, whatever his name is, he literally said that the universe is too intricate not to be designed. Now, of course, he doesn't believe in God, but you know what a lot of them are saying now? That, there are, that Earth and evolution and all this stuff, was act- a lot of scientists are now starting to just come out and say, yeah, evolution is just not possible without the help of something. They're recognizing that, listen, evolution is literally a mathematical impossibility. It mathematically could. So what they're saying is now is that, well, we still believe in evolution, but we believe that there was some kind of alien outsider, higher life form that helped guide it. That's what they're saying. They'll recognize the fact that this universe is too complex in order to just be all made by mistake. So notice now, the, the, the universe... The creation declares the existence of God. Not only that, but the conscience. Romans chapter 2, we just read the verse. The conscience declares the existence of God. And third of all, the commandments proclaim the existence of God. Romans chapter 3 talks about the law and the commandments and stuff. So understand, God has revealed himself to mankind through the conscience. And that's why you better obey your conscience. That's why you better not, what does Paul talk about? Paul talks about searing the conscience with a hot iron. Paul talks about defiling your conscience. Paul talks about corrupting your conscience. Paul talks about, me. you just look up the word conscience in there. Paul said, I am of a clean conscience. Conscience is knowing good and evil. Verse 22, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So now notice, we now find what the purpose of the tree of life is. What is the purpose of the tree of life? You eat it, and what happens? You live forever. Now, here's what's so crazy to me. You ready? Here's what's so crazy to me. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but notice, why does Eve eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because it was pleasant to the eyes, it was a tree good for food, and it was able to make her wise, right? But now, I want you to notice chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, and look there at verse number, oh, let's see, where is it? Verse number 9, look at verse number 9, Genesis 2, 9. Notice what the Bible says here. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life had just the same things that the tree of knowledge had. But there was some... some, Listen, the, the devil didn't want them to eat... I've got a message I'm working on that it looks good to do right. All the advantages that you think you'll gain out of doing wrong are never worth the advantages that you'll gain by doing right. You don't do right to get ahead. You do right because it's right. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, do right even if the stars fall. Understand that the tree of life was there so that they could gain immortality. And notice if they would have eaten the tree of life while in a sinful state, they would have lived forever in a sinful body. The tree of life is there in order to give somebody eternal life. But the tree of life shows back up all the way back in Revelation chapter 22. Go all the way back to Revelation chapter 22. Now we're Bible believers, right? We don't believe that people are saved the same way throughout all dispensations. For somebody to say that Adam was saved by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the dumbest statement on planet Earth. 
We understand that people are saved in different ways. So in the future, there are going to be some people that eat the truth. Now, now, how many of you are saved? All right? So what do you have right now? You have eternal life, right? You have everlasting life. Is eternal life something that you're going to gain in the future, or is it something you have right now? It's a present possession, right? He that believeth on the Son hath present tense life. But now notice... Notice Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Notice there's a group of people in the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom that in order to gain their eternal life, they have to eat of the tree. They don't trust Jesus Christ as their savior. They eat of the tree of the knowledge, excuse me, of the tree of life. And how do they gain access to the tree of life? They do what? They keep his commandments. Well, that doesn't sound like salvation by grace through faith, right? That's because not everybody saved the same way through. And they eat the tree of life and they gain interest. And I think it's interesting, you know, that all the modern Bibles change Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14? All of them. You know what they say? Instead of blessed are they that do his commandments, they say blessed are those who have washed their robes. John R. Rice even said one time that he prefers the reading of the ASV there because the King James Bible implies that a man can work for his salvation. Bible corrector. But notice that's what the Bible says. Blessed are they do his commandments. Now, excuse me, go back to Genesis chapter number 3. Go back to Genesis chapter number 3. All right, verse 23. So because Bam could eat of the tree and live forever, what did God do? Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove, 24, so he drove out the man. And notice, driving out the man from the Garden of Eden was not punishment for the sin. God had already given out the punishments. Notice, the reason why God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden is so they wouldn't eat of the tree of life. You see, why? That's not a punishment. God doesn't want Adam and Eve to live forever in a sinful state. If they had never died, they would have never been released from the body of sin. Right? That's why the Bible says in Psalms 116, precious in the sight of the Lord is what? The death of His saints. God takes no pleasure in the wicked, but boy, he sure does take pleasure in the death of the righteous. Why? Because they're finally released from that body of sin. That's why death is a release. That's why Paul said in Philippians 1, he said, uh, 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 to depart and be with Christ is far better. He says, for I'm in a strait betwixt two, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, or to remain with you, which is more needful for you. So notice, death, What? and, and I think this is so beautiful, Death was the punishment, right? The day you eat the tree, you were going to what? Die. But what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. And isn't it crazy that, listen, death wound up being the punishment, but at the very end, death ends up being the release from the punishment. See, God can take something bad and turn it into good. Isn't that a beautiful principle there? Verse 24, so he drove out the man... And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. People say, Preacher, where is this all at? Where is the Garden of Eden? Well, we're just not sure. Wherever it is, I, I think personally, I'm, I'm going to give you a theory here. We'll close out this. We'll get out just a touch early today. But I'm going to give you a theory, my theory, about where I believe the Garden of Eden is. People say, where's the Garden of Eden, Preacher? People have looked all throughout I mean, one old boy said it, the Garden of Eden was somewhere down in Florida. God help us. Yeah, I, I know for a fact it ain't. I've, I've, been there, I've been there a few times. It ain't in Florida. I want you to take your Bibles, look at Ezekiel 31. What happened to the Garden of Eden? I'm going to give you what I think happened to the Garden of Eden. Ezekiel chapter 31, and I want you to notice verse 16. Ezekiel 31, 16. All right, if you there, say amen. amen. All right, Ezekiel 31, 16. The Bible says here, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, 
when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water, shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto, unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm, that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen, to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden under the nether parts of the earth. I believe we'll close right here. I believe that the Garden of Eden, either during Noah's flood or sometime after the fall, at some point, I believe the Garden of Eden sank down into the center of the earth and when you read about paradise in the Bible, in Luke 16, that the, that the poor man Lazarus went to, I believe that he went into the Garden of Eden, which is in the middle of the earth. It's in the other parts of the earth. That's why this whole thing about the hollow earth and the inner earth and the inner sun might not be as far-fetched as you think. So that's my theory about where the Garden of Eden's at, all right? Any comments, questions, or concerns? All right, let's pray. We'll get out of here. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church. God, I pray you bless our time here together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, you are dismissed. I love you.